Shalom, Chris Renock here. I just got a question in on Twitter, and uh, it was such a good question, and it really takes a lot more to answer than just a few tweets, so I thought I'd make a video uh, of it. Here's the question that I received. Chris, I watched your videos. Can I just ask you if you believe Paul's letters slash doctrines pre-Jerusalem Council are erroneous? Now, for those of you who haven't seen my video entitled Taking Paul's Letters in Context, I really encourage you to watch that video. Actually, I would encourage you to pause this video right now and go and watch that video, Taking Paul's Letters in Context, because you need to understand the background that this particular gentleman is coming from. Let me just briefly go through it here. The Twelve Apostles carried on the ministry of Jesus for a certain amount of time before Paul was called. We see in Acts chapter 9, Paul was called, and uh, he was saved, and to make a long story short, he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles, okay? So most of the other apostles were, you know, primarily called to be an apostle to the Jewish people. So Paul, being an apostle to the Gentiles, went to the Gentiles, was preaching to the Gentiles. Now, in Acts chapter 21, we see Paul coming back to what you might call the home church, where the apostle James was more or less the, the leader there with all of the elders that were present. Paul comes back to his home church and says, you know what, guys, it's awesome what the, what the Gentiles are experiencing. You know, they're coming uh, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are believing. They are repenting. It's just awesome works going on here. And, you know, it says they all praise God. They're like, praise God. That's great, Paul. But, but, but wait a second. We've got a big problem here. We've got a huge problem here, okay? Now, it's rumor, rumored that, that you're teaching some people against Moses. In other words, against the Torah, against the law. It's rumored that you're teaching some people against the law and against circumcision and against the customs. Now, you know, to understand the Jewish context here, the, the word customs, it, you know, that encompasses a lot, okay? The customs of the Pharisees, the customs of the Jews in those times. That's going beyond the law. That's going beyond the Torah. But the apostles, the original 12 apostles, took issue with the rumor. I want to say, make it clear, it was a rumor that Paul was speaking against the Torah, against Moses, against uh, circumcision, and against the customs. So what they did is they, you know, they confronted Paul about it. And they, you know, asked him about it. And basically, in context, Paul said basically, no, that's not, the, that's, not, that's not right at all. They got it completely wrong. So they said, well, wait a second, Paul. Wait a second. We need proof here. We need proof. We need you to go to the extreme to prove that this is not true at all. That you are actually in obedience to the law. And you are submitting yourself to the law, to Moses and to the customs. We need to really nail this down. We need to really prove to the world that you are not speaking against the law. So what they said was, they said, well, we're going to, we're going to require you to, to take a vow. Now in context, if you know anything about the vow that they're talking about, they're talking about the vow that's spoken of in Numbers chapter six, the vow of the, uh, the vow of the Nazarite. So they said to Paul, we want you to take the vow, basically the vow of the Nazarite. In context, that's what they're talking about, the vow of the Nazarite. Now, anybody who knows anything about the vow of the Nazarite, the Nazarite vow, that is a very strict, very extreme vow. It's one of the most extreme vows you can take. Taking the vow of the Nazarite to prove your allegiance to the Torah is like uh, doing a Felix Baumgartner jump from space to prove that you're not afraid of heights, okay? I mean, it's an extreme measure to tell someone, you know what, you, you're, you're, uh, uh, you say you're not against Torah? Well, take the vow, the vow of the Nazarite. Take this vow, the vow of the Nazarite. So it's, it, it's an extreme measure. It's, it's, a, it's a very strict measure. It's a very hard thing to do. And it's a very costly thing to do. It, it costs a lot to bring to to uh, to pay for the animal sacrifices and such. But that wasn't enough for these for the apostles. The apostles said to Paul, "We not we we're not only requiring that you take the vow, but we are requiring that you sponsor 
four other men in taking the vow as well. You're going to sponsor four men and yourself. Okay, you're going to prove this five times over, and it's going to cost you a pretty penny. And Paul, without blinking an eye, obliged. Paul, without arguing at all, he said, sure, okay. Now, in the video, taking Paul's letters in context, I have a little part of that video that I want to play right now. This is talking about Paul's letters chronologically, when they were written, and when this confrontation happened. Just watch this. So let's again look at the chronology of Scripture regarding Paul. We've got all these books that either Paul have, has written himself or books like Acts and Second Peter that talk about Paul. Now, what books, if there's any, and many Christians like to quote things about, you know, Christ is the end of law and this kind of thing, and they totally misinterpret, misunderstand what that means. But what books do they always quote from? Well, they quote from Galatians, they quote from uh, Romans, they quote from Colossians, and, you know, they can quote from some of the other books as well. But these are the main books that they quote from. Now, I want you to, to uh, really pay attention here that these books are before the book of Acts. So these books were written most likely before Acts chapter 21, the incident in Acts chapter 21. It's very, very significant. And then after the book of Acts was written, the letters that Paul wrote, this is after he was confronted by James and all the elders of the church, confronted basically by his pastor, so to speak, or his uh, church authorities about this misunderstanding and how, how he was telling people to forsake the law or forsake Moses. Now, I want you to very, very look at this very, very carefully here. After Acts, in 2 Timothy, Titus, or 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, those books that Paul wrote, you don't see anything in there about grace versus law, you know, Christ is the end of the law. You know, it, Paul refrains from any of this stuff, okay? Why is that? Why is it that it seems like before the book of Acts, um, before the book of Acts uh, incident, he seems to be writing in what seems to be looking like he's speaking kind of, a, it looks like against the law, which, you know, I don't think he really, I mean, it's misinterpreted or twisted to make it, to make it sound like that. Um, because we see in the book of Romans, for example, that Paul said, you know, do we make the law void by faith? Like, is, is the law uh, not, um, is, the, is the law not in effect anymore because now we have faith in Jesus? He said, no, we establish the law by our faith, okay? So we got these little, these little hints in here that what he's saying about the law and about, the, and about all these little things is not really what it sounds like he's saying. And he proves it in Acts chapter 21. And then afterwards, in first and uh, first and second Timothy and Titus, he proves it by changing his style of writing. In these books, he didn't write the same way as he wrote in these books. Okay, so we see that before this confrontation in Acts chapter twenty-one, Paul wrote letters that seemed to seem to contra you know seem to contradict the law, seem to talk about you know uh, being against the law being against circumcision and being against the customs of the Jews. And after the, the confrontation of Acts chapter 21, we see that Paul started writing differently. He wrote, you know, his style changed quite a bit. You know, we don't see in, in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus, anything about grace versus law or against circumcision or anything like that, where it seemed to be that was his theme before. So this particular gentleman that tweeted me uh, saw the video and uh, asked this question. You know, do I believe that the letters that Paul wrote, the doctrines that Paul had pre-Jerusalem Council, in other words, before he was confronted by James and, and the other apostles and, and the elders of the church, do you believe that Paul's letters previous to that confrontation is erroneous? The short answer is no. The long answer is very well could be. Okay, uh, let me explain before you before you get completely turned off. Let me explain. Generally speaking, now when I say the short answer is no, I mean generally speaking. I'm not saying that we should file, you know, Galatians, Romans, Corinthians, Colossians, all this stuff. File it under erroneous or just throw it out. I'm not saying that at all. Okay, so the biggest thing that Paul has going for him 
is that Peter said in 2 Peter that Paul is the beloved brother. So Peter didn't say anything really explicitly against Paul other than saying that his letters are written in such a way that a lot of people misunderstand it and distort it and you know, and, and use Paul's letters basically as a, a license to sin, you know, as a license to do things contrary to Torah. Is Paul's letters erroneous? Now, uh, a lot of you know that there are, you know, ultra conservative evangelical Christians out there that say everything in the Bible is the word of God. Every single word of it is God's word to us, you know, including all of Paul's letters. Paul said a lot in his letters about addressing specific people. You know, go, you know, greet, you know, greet Priscilla and greet Aquila. Now, I mean, Paul said a lot of stuff like this, okay? If you think that every single word that Paul wrote is God's word for you, then you better go find Priscilla and Aquila and all the other people that Paul mentions that we're supposed to meet and greet and, and such, okay? It's just really... <laughs> the lack of better word, it's ridiculous to think that every single word that Paul wrote is God's word for us. Okay, it's not. We got to look at the Bible for what it really is. Okay, it's a collection of books. We got to look at Paul's letters for what they really are. They're actually Paul's letters. They're not books. Paul didn't write a book like Jeremiah did, like Isaiah did. Paul didn't write that. He wrote a letter. We're actually, when we're reading Paul's letters, we are actually reading someone else's mail. We are actually reading someone else's personal mail, okay? You got to look at it for what it really is. You can't, you can't go by what every televangelist says, what, what Paul's letters is. You can't go by what every preacher, pastor, bishop priest says what Paul's letters are. You got to go by really what Paul's letters are. And they are just Paul's letters. They are not, a, they are not, first of all, you got to realize who Paul is. Paul is not one of the 12. He, I mean, Jesus could have called him easily. And when, when he was walking the earth in flesh and blood, he could have went to Paul and called him easily. He, he did not call Paul to be one of the 12. When uh, in the in the beginning of the book of Acts, when they chose someone to replace Judas, they did not choose Paul to replace Judas. OK, so Paul is not a replacement of Judas. He's not one of the 12. He's just an apostle. This is what a lot of people don't understand. Paul is just an apostle. He's not. He does not claim to be a prophet. OK, and this is what a lot of the Christian world really treats Paul's letters as if they are letters from a prophet like Jeremiah, like Isaiah, like Daniel, you know, which they are not. You got to understand what an apostle really is, what the word apostle is, what it means. The word apostle means sent one. You are the one that sent. If I ask you to go get a, a glass of water for me, you are an apostle for water. Okay, I send you, you are an apostle, because the word apostle is just a tra it's just a fancy word that's transliterated from the Greek, which means to be sent. I send you. Let's say I say, I say to you, could you go to the store and get me a loaf of bread? Okay, you are an apostle of mine. You are an apostle for a loaf of bread. Okay, Paul is an apostle of the Lord to the Gentiles. The, all that means is that Jesus actually spoke to him and said, Go to the Gentiles and preach my gospel. That's it. That's it. The 12 apostles have more authority than Paul ever had. Okay? Paul's name is not written on the foundation of heaven where it says the 12 apostles is written on the foundation of heaven. Okay? So we got to realize when we're reading Paul's letters, we got to realize what we're actually reading. We are reading letters, personal letters from Paul. Who's Paul? Paul's not one of the apostles. He did not walk and talk with Jesus in the flesh. He did not have that privilege. He did not have that authority. He did not have that experience. Okay. So should we throw Paul's letters out? No, I do not believe that we should throw Paul's letters out. He is, uh, it, it, Paul's letters are uh, an asset to the church because Paul is from an era that we're not from. Paul knows things that we don't know. He doesn't know as much as the 12. He doesn't know as much as the 12, but he knows things that we don't know. Okay, so do, do I think that we should file Paul's letters as erroneous? I would say, generally speaking, no. Uh, can there be errors in Paul's letters? 
Well, absolutely there can be, because he's just an apostle. It's not like every step he takes is the step of Jesus. It's not like every step he takes is the step, is God walking. It's not like every word that he wrote is God's word. Actually, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, in one particular instance, he says, what I say to you is my word, not the Lord's word. Okay? I mean, not every word that Paul wrote is God's word. You got to realize that it's not. So is there room for error? Yes, there is room for error. Okay? I would take Paul's letters over, you know, a, a a thousand pastors today because of the fact that Paul did have an experience with Jesus, not as much as the 12, but he did have an experience. He did get saved and he did come from that era. He did come from that culture that is just a lot. He knows a lot more about that culture since he lived in it than we do. So I would take Paul's letters over a thousand pastors, over a thousand ministers, okay? However, would I say that Paul's letters is perfect? No. Is there room for error? Yes, there is. Okay? You got to look at it from, from you got to look at it for what it really is, okay? Was Paul wrong in what he said regarding the law in Romans, Galatians, Colossians, Corinthians? Was he wrong? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it was just because of the way he presented it, just the way he wrote it. I mean, there's lots of stuff out there on, on the internet. You can read about different interpretations of what Paul meant by the law, okay? And I'm not going to get into that uh, in this video. Do I believe that Paul's doctrines and letters pre-Jerusalem council are erroneous? The answer is, gen generally speaking, if you were to just throw a general blanket answer over it, I would say... No, I wouldn't file them as trash, okay? Uh, if you look into the details, yes, there's room for error. Yes, there are. there is room for error. Final thought, what you've got to understand is, now, I, I, I'm known to say this, the Bible is not biblical. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, we see in the in the Torah, we see in, in the prophets, we see in, let's say, the book of Revelation, and in other places where God specifically commanded certain people, write this down, you know, pass it on from generation to generation. But God never commanded anyone in the Bible to actually compile all these books into one book and call it the Bible. Okay? There is nowhere that God, there's nowhere in the Bible where God ever spoke to someone and said, this is the canon. Okay? I don't, canon, Bible canons, there are many of them. Which one is really of God? Which Bible canon is perfect? I really don't think that any of them are perfect perfect because God is not into canons, okay? He's into people actually sitting down with each book individually, reading them, studying them for what they are, knowing who wrote this book, where it's from, what culture it's in, what culture it's in, what authority does it have? I mean, God is not into just super super simple blanket statements and just just kind of blurring everything together. No. He wants you to read every book for what it really is, and to really understand the author, the culture, the context of each book, the authority of, of each book, okay? Check out my previous video about, you know, the 10 points of uh, learning how to study the Bible, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll link to that as well in the description. And I'll also link it to the uh, Taking Paul's Letters in Context link in, in the description. So please don't leave a comment on this video unless you've actually did some research. There's so many people that leave comments and they're just absolutely ignorant, uneducated. Check out my videos. Do your research. Check out other people's points of view, okay? Check out other stuff. Don't just leave a comment just because what I say is going against everything you've heard in your life because it just might be true.